Before Rome became a republic, and eventually an empire, the nation that would form the crux of Western civilization was at one point a tiny monarchy on the Italian coast. Before the discussion of the Roman kings starts, there is a unique quality about the Roman kings that I would like to touch on, and that is that for most of Rome's monarchy, the position was not hereditary. Only with the fifth king onward was the title of king passed down. The role of the king in Roman society was absolute governance. The early Roman senate had very little power, and their kings held the ability to govern on their own, declare wars, and be the chief judge in legal affairs. Initially, when a Roman king died, the Roman senate took over the governing duties and elected a new king. Since the senate did represent the landowning class, the Roman people technically elected their ruler even during this time. The other important thing to note is that the kings of Rome are not known to have ever truly existed. When Rome was sacked in the 4th century BC, the city's archives were destroyed. The only thing that we have to go off of is traditional legend and some later Roman historians that mention these kings, and some sparse archaeological evidence that we can kind of piece things together. So while it can be assumed that there could have been a monarchy, we don't really know for sure. With that all being said, let's hop right into it. Rome's first king was none else than Romulus himself. We are all familiar with the myths surrounding Romulus and the creation of the city, so I won't really go into that. After the slaying of Remus, Romulus began his work to expand Roman influence and grow his city. This involved raiding nearby settlements, granting asylum for refugees and fugitives, and creating the early Roman Senate. The Romans began to fight with their northern Etruscan neighbors during his reign, but the city still grew. Legend says that Romulus died in 716 BC. An interregnum of one year occurred as the Senate chose the next king of Rome. They chose a man by the name of Numa Pompilius. Numa Pompilius is known in Roman history as a king of peace and juxtaposition to Romulus, a king of war. Pompilius spent his time as king building infrastructure and massive public works such as the Temple of Janus. He also organized Rome's state religion and, most importantly, established small villages around the city to provide it income, influence, and territory. Inside Rome and these villages, Pompilius sponsored the creation of guilds and early forms of what we would call today as corporations. The pendulum for war swung back when Tullus Hostilius took the throne following the death of Pompilius. Tullus spent his time expanding Roman influence in the surrounding regions like his predecessors. The most famous event that is attributed to him was the Battle of Alba Longa. This mythical battle pitted triplets from the two cities against each other. The winner would get the other cities a prize. Rome sent the Herati, and Alba Longa sent the Curiati. The Herati won the battle, and so Alba Longa became part of Rome. The other major event that Tullus participated in was the creation of the Curia Hostilia, the name for the Roman Senate House. Although, because of some conflicting dates, the Senate House could have been built a little earlier. Rome's fourth king, Ancus Marcius, was also known as a king of war. He led campaigns of conquest against the Latins, who earlier had made incursions on Roman lands. The Roman army swept through the Latin territory and conquered vast swathes of territory, eventually pushing all the way to the sea. It was here that the port town of Ostia was said to have been founded. Ostia functioned as Rome's seaport since, like the city, it was settled alongside the Tiber River. The city itself continued to grow in size, and by now was a medium power on the Italian peninsula. After he died peacefully of natural causes, the grandson of Rome's second king, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, took the throne. The most crucial fact about Priscus's rule is that he established the hereditary aspect of the monarchy. Following him, every other Roman king would be related to each other. Priscus also conquered more land from the surrounding tribes and constructed the Circus Maximus and the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus and he celebrated the first ever triumph in Roman history to celebrate his conquests. 
His death from assassination caused upheaval, and in all the commotion, his wife was able to put his son on the throne instead of the intended next king. Servius Tullius focused heavily on reforming the Roman government. He allowed more groups of people the right to vote, such as other tribes and minor landowners. He also implemented the census and organized the citizens into clans. That way, it would be easier to mobilize an army, tax them, and get a good idea of how well the city was developing. Tullius also made advancements in city planning by separating Rome into four quarters and helped the Roman economy by banning debt bondage, and he made some monetary reforms, although these are not totally backed up by modern historians. Further still, Tullius expanded the city's territory and then built the Temple of Diana on the Aventine Hill. The seventh and final king is the one who messed everything up. To this point, the Roman kings had been fair and strong leaders who had brought at least one thing to the table that justified their rule, and the people were happy about that. When Lucius Tarquinius Superbus took the throne, he was none of these things. Tarquin was either the son or grandson of the fifth king, and usurped the throne after he had assassins kill the previous king. Upon taking the throne, Tarquin refused to bury the previous king, murdered senators who disagreed with him, used judicial power to suppress opponents, and then started a series of wars against the wealthy cities near Rome. While he was victorious, the constant wars took a toll on the people, and they began to grow weary and untrusting of the king. Things came to a head in 509 BC when a popular revolt against the embattled king occurred. Tarquin called on his Etruscan allies for help, and over the course of the year a large war was fought. By the end of the war, Tarquin had been forced to leave the city and the Senate took over. It is from this point in Roman mythological history that the Republic was born. While these kings may not have existed at all, what is important is that each of them represented a value that the Romans either encouraged or, in the case of Tarquin, hated. These seven kings should be understood not just as historic rulers, but more so as the archetype of what type of leaders the Roman citizens wanted. Each of them exemplified values that were important. For instance, the second king of Rome was thoughtful and knowledgeable and very pious, whereas Romulus was very warlike. Many of the other kings were bent on expanding their realm, and to the Romans, people who thought that their legacy had descended from Mars himself, this made a lot of sense. So once again, when taking a look at these rulers, it is important to understand that while they may not have totally existed, to the people of Rome, their ideals existed and that was good enough for them. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this episode of Lesser Known History, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel, and I will see you all in the next episode. Have a great day.